Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's live stream again here at uh, Rashu Christi. Uh, I'm Karnu van Yerden with Rashu Christi South Africa. For those who do not know uh, who we are as Rashu Christi, Rashu Christi is an international Christian apologetics ministry. By virtue of our name, which means reason for Christ, in Latin it means, uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, it means it, it's reason for Christ in Latin. Uh, we seek to defend and give reasons for the truth of the Christian faith. And it's also flowing from the biblical commandment in 1 Peter 3 verse 15 to 16, where we are to give a reason for the hope that is in us. If you want to know more about Rashu Christi and who we, what we do, who we are as a ministry, also, if you're looking for some cool resources, if you're looking for some uh, good reading on articles, we have multiple articles posted already on the website. Please visit us at www.rashukristi.co.za. Um, and also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You know, just click that subscription and click the notification bell. Um, but yeah, and um, also, if you enjoy the work that we are doing as a ministry in Rashu Christi and you want to help us, continue doing this work um we also please consider donating uh, to the ministry as well um if you wish to donate you can just click the link in the description below um uh, of this video and uh, it would really uh, uh yeah you can just uh, click it there but uh yeah without further ado tonight's topic natural law theory a topic that i find very interesting and i really enjoy but uh, yes, tonight our speaker is Dr. Richard G. Howe, who will be presenting to us on natural law tonight. And uh, Dr. Dr. Howe is a very good friend of RC South Africa, and he has uniquely contributed to our ministry efforts in the past. For example, many of you may know him. He has been um, at uh, multiple uh, symposiums when he came to uh, South Africa. He's been uh, at our symposiums. He has also engaged with a few South African scholars in debate as well. But furthermore, Dr. Howe is also a, uh, he's a writer, a speaker, a public debater in churches, conferences, and university campuses on issues concerning Christian apologetics and philosophy. He is an emeritus professor at the, uh, of uh, philosophy and apologetics at Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he still teaches part-time. Dr. Howe is also the past president of the International Society of Christian Apologetics. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Howe, please take us away. Absolutely. Thank you, Carnell. Appreciate those kind words and welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, letting me be here and giving me part of your evening. We talk about uh, natural law theory. I want to uh, uh, show you how you can get a PDF deck of the PowerPoint that I'm going to be showing you tonight. And you'll want to do that for two reasons. One, uh, I may have a citation now and then, and it might go by kind of quickly. And you wanted, hey, what what was the book exactly? What page was that on? So you want to get the PDF uh, slide deck. Uh, the second reason is that there are a lot of slides in the presentation that I'll skip for the sake of time. Many of them are a lot of the citations to sort of bolster a point that this is what this philosopher or this theologian says about this particular point, those kind of things. And also maybe even some of the uh, more detailed points uh, themselves, just the whole point might be left out for the sake of time. So you can get a more robust picture of natural law if you go to, the, the, to my website. So I have to warn people, I'm not a web developer, as you, as you can probably tell. Let me, let me, am I sharing that yet or not? Let me make sure that I am. Hold on just a second, because you'll, you'll want to see this. This is, this is worth the price of admission here. Um, so you can, you can look at it and tell I'm not a web developer, but I think all the links work, Carnu, so I think we're in good shape. But right across the uh, top there, it, this is the uh, website, uh, richardghow.com, and you'll see the tabs at the top. Let me just point one out to you that says resources. When you click on that, it'll bring you to a page and there's four choices. If I happen to say during the presentation, hey, I've got a paper on my website, then you'll wanna to go to papers. Papers I've written, papers other people have written, PDFs you can download, links to things on the internet. Same thing with multimedia. 
if I say there's an MP3 or an MP4 you can download or links to things, things I've done, things other people have done, links to people uh, on the internet. Also, my church, Midway Community Church, I bring you greetings from the saints at Midway Community Church here in uh, north part of Atlanta, way up north of Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and so I did some stuff in my church over the years, and you're welcome to some of those uh, Bible studies and other kinds of things. But the thing that's relevant for us tonight is the option here, the PowerPoint PDF slide decks. When you click that, it'll take you to, a, in effect, a alphabetized list of all the presentations. Many of these, if not most, are things that I do in my courses at the seminary. Uh, but also other things I've done outside of that in public speaking. So you just scroll down until you see natural law theory and just click on that. And that's how you can do it. So Carnu uh, mentioned at the, uh, the seminary, we, uh, everything we offer is completely online. Uh, you can do anything we have online, all the degrees. So I invite you to go to ses.edu and see what you can find there. There are options for degrees, but there are also options for non-degrees and audit. If you're just interested in and, uh, and expanding your understanding of uh, various philosophy and uh, philosophical theological issues. So I invite you to do that. <clears throat> so let me give a summary of what we mean by natural law theory. And I wanna begin by disabusing, just in case somebody's watching and may not be familiar with that expression, because understandably, I think people, when they hear the term natural law, they're probably gonna think of natural physical laws, things like electricity or, uh, you know, electromagnetism or gravity or the strong and weak nuclear forces or things like that. And certainly those are natural laws in the way we talk about. But this phrase natural law was coined before there was really an understanding of natural physical laws. And you'll see why it's called natural laws, a specific reason why it's called that. And what it is, is a, a philosophical and theological view of goodness, the good, and human morality based on the nature of, let's just see who God is and the nature of human beings. What is it? What is God? What kind of being is he? And what are we as human beings? You'll notice as I make the presentation that I'm going to call, as natural law theorists do, from really two sources to bolster the and build the argument. Uh, arguments from reason, just from sound reason. Uh, a subsection of what we can know about the world is general revelation, things that God has specifically said about himself through the things that, he've, that he's made, Romans 1.20 uh, and also Romans 2.14 and 15, which will be relevant as we go along. But not only general revelation uh, and creation tells us certain things that will be relevant to human morality, but also careful biblical exegesis, the, the excavating of the truth of passages of scripture uh, in accordance with sound principles of interpretation. And that's known as special revelation. In fact, uh, in a moment of shameless self-promotion, I invite you to check out on the website as well, a curriculum that I wrote. You can find out how to purchase that. I don't get residuals from this, so it's not like a commercial for me. Um, but it's a six-part study, DVD, and workbook on revelation. Not the book of revelation, but the doctrine of general revelation and special revelation. So by way of summary then, just so we'll kind of know where this target, what our target is, natural law theory maintains that certain moral truths can be known by human reason apart from scripture. Now, that might be an affront to some Christians to think that there are such uh, serious issues that somehow we can have important information about that's not revealed in God's word. But when I place it in context, I think you'll understand why that's not quite as shocking, perhaps, as some people might think on, on, on initially hearing that. It maintains that the objectivity of morality arises approximately from the fact that human beings each possess a human nature. We'll come back to this concept of a, what is a nature, by virtue of which the human is human, and in terms of which his good is defined. So I'm highlighting these to flag things that we'll unpack in due course. But this is proximate. Ultimately, the objectivity arises from the fact that God is goodness itself, whatever that ends up looking like. We'll say something about that as we wind things up this evening. So natural law theory maintains that possessing a human nature, an expression I just used, 
means that humans have a teleology. Teleology, you're probably familiar with that term, like the teleological argument, for example. A uh, teleology, the root word there is the Greek word telos, which means end or goal, or sometimes purpose. It's something towards which a changing thing is aiming. And so natural law theory maintains that possessing human nature means that we as humans have a goal, an, an end toward which human nature aims. There's some kind of destiny towards which our humanness points us. It maintains that this end or goal, because it arises from our nature, is, quote, natural for us. So you want to be careful not to um, import too much into these terms from what you're used to thinking probably as apologists, uh, natural versus supernatural. So, and so sometimes understandably, and I think rightfully so in some instances, Christians have an allergy against natural when it starts to seemingly encroach upon what we know to be the purview of the supernatural. But that's not really the use of the term natural that we're using here uh, always. So just be aware that even though the word is the same in English, it's not always meaning that. It's primarily meaning that we have a human nature. Uh, and so this, this natural for us, uh, this, this uh, end or goal, and that this end or goal constitutes our good. So again, I'm highlighting these words to uh, uh, revisit here later. So you could think of it, the big picture is this, a virtuous individual becoming a virtuous individual, the morality in us as just as humans, not as Christians necessarily, but just as human beings. The level of virtue that a human is able to achieve, things like uh, fidelity and friendship and courage and, and truthfulness and kindness and these kind of things. To be sure, as fruit of the Spirit, they're only available to us once we are born again. But, but the argument is there's levels of that that are available even among the lost, and that's one of the means by God's common grace that he superintends the affairs of humans on the earth, that he constrains evil to some extent so that it's possible to have uh, stable nations, at least stable enough for humans to flourish to some extent. So natural law points to a uh, developing a virtuous individual as part of a flourishing community. And then a righteous individual, which is imputed to us, it's not earned by anything we do, but it's, it's uh, imputed righteousness, Romans 4, verses 4 and 5 what makes us an individual as part of a heavenly community, right? So the bottom is natural to us in that it arises out of our natures as human. The, the, uh, the upward part there is supernatural, meaning it's only, it only happens because of the grace of God, the intrusion of God's grace into uh, his world and bringing people to, to uh, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then indwelling them with the Holy Spirit and then embarking them in a life of of a progressive sanctification, hopefully, and then ultimate sanctification and glorification in heaven. So the bottom one then is our good in this life. And the upper one then is our good in the next life. So the bottom one would be something like Romans 12, 17, and 18. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And I think the implication there is there is uh, uh, Paul is talking about how we as Christians comport ourselves in a world of non-Christians and there's got to be some kind of, of manner according to which Christians and non-Christians can peacefully coexist if, if you will and of course the Romans 4 passage I alluded to now to him who works the wages are not counted as grace but as debt but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted uh, for, uh, for righteousness. Just a few observations, and then we'll get into some details. Uh, natural law theory accounts for human morality and human law within a broader context of law within God's creation with regard to human nature. And it stands in stark contrast to the view of God and morality commonly found in evangelical apologetics. And you'll see why that is in a moment. I may be sort of poisoning the well a little bit to think, okay, Hal's going to give us something that is maybe oblique from what I've been hearing from other apologists uh, out in the uh, cyberspace. 
this is especially true, and this is for the philosophy geeks out there. This is especially true that it's a different kind of approach to these questions regarding uh, the commonly found among contemporary Christian analytic philosophers. So I won't bother to unpack what analytic philosophy is. Uh, if you don't already know, but perhaps that can come out uh, here in due course. As a model of morality that flows and follows from the contours and categories of ancient Greek and medieval philosophies, natural law will do, as you'll see. Natural law theory traffics in certain fundamental concepts, most of which themselves need to be impact. In fact, I, I would invite you to go to the website, click on resources, go to PDF decks, and get my uh, series of, of uh, presentations there on classical philosophy, where all of these are unpacked to some extent at an, at an introductory level if the categories are not familiar to you. I hope to be able in our short time together to just explain some of these categories, at least enough for it to, to so that you can see its relevance to uh, the question at hand. So there you see things like law, which I already mentioned, we've already mentioned nature or natural, human nature. We'll talk a little bit about nature versus function, substance versus accident. Some of these we won't talk about. Uh, but act and potency, we've already mentioned teleology, existence, good and evil, uh, good and moral good, obligation, the transcendentals. Isn't that sound fun? The convertibility of being and good, what in the world? And then, of course, the, the climax of the whole thing is God as being and God as goodness itself. So I take some advice from one of my influences in philosophy. Aristotle said this. Our discussion will be adequate if it has as much clearness as the subject matter admits of, for precision is not to be sought for alike in all discussions, for it is the mark of an educated man to look for precision in each class of things, just so far as the nature of the subject admits. Now, one other maybe piece of advice, and, and if not warning, uh, if you get into philosophy, enough and maybe too much, then this can actually happen to your eyeballs. So if you start seeing your friends and that starts happening to their eyes, it may very well be that they've been doing a little bit too much of philosophy. Now let me bring it then closer to home. And if you'll indulge me for just like two minutes, I, I nest this in the context of my experience as an American. And the reason why I think it's not irrelevant to a, a South African audience, which is my primary audience, but of course, once this is archived, it'll be accessible from people any, anywhere. But the reason why it's still relevant to a South African audience, even though the, the sort of template that I'm using initially is going to be exclusively American, is because I, I want to draw out from that template uh, the, the embedded principles there. And then this is just an American way it was expressed. But then there are South African ways the exact same thing is expressed and in other ways it expressed even long before there was America and America, for example. So uh, we just celebrated our uh, Independence Day, 4th of July here in the United States. It's a, it's a raucous celebration. Even though the, we have the lockdown, people were shooting fireworks. And so the Declaration of Independence is really our birth certificate. Now it's not a legal document, uh, but it sets a, it sets a context uh, in which the legal documents like our constitution uh, arose. And to the degree that someone who wants to understand the American experience, to the degree that they ignore this context, I think to a certain degree they can misunderstand uh, what's supposed to be going on in, in the legal establishment. But the declaration starts out, and maybe some of this might be familiar to, to some of you, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to sever the political bonds which connect them with another and assume among the powers of the earth the separate but equal station are separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect for the opinions of mankind require that they should give a reason which impel them to the separation. Now, here's the part that most Americans are familiar with. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. When any government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it in laying its foundations in such principles and establishing its powers in such form as to seem to them most likely to, uh, to affect their safety and happiness. 
The key here is this phrase, laws of nature and nature's God. Again, it's not laws of nature like electromagnetism or gravity. It's going to be a moral law. The Declaration of Independence was heavily influenced by a number of philosophers. A great book, if you're interested in the uh, American experience, uh, defending the Declaration, how the Bible and Christianity in influenced the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, John Locke is probably the, the most uh, quoted philosopher by the American founding fathers. And interestingly, at least I haven't counted, but according to sources I've read and heard, uh, whereas the American founding fathers quote John Locke more than anybody, John Locke quotes the Apostle Paul more than anybody. Now, let me tie this in to something even closer to home for my immediate audience here. This is Clarence Thomas, uh, one of the uh, justices on the United States Supreme Court. Maybe you recognize his face. I suspect most people would not recognize this gentleman's face and likely would not necessarily recognize his name. Uh, he is a professor of constitutional law at Harvard University. And when Clarence Thomas was first nominated for the Supreme Court, it was a big controversy. But a lot of people miss what the controversy was. The controversy was over the fact that Clarence Thomas was an adherent of natural law theory. And, uh, uh, and Lawrence Tribe raises that as a scary prospect. Ooh, it's natural law. Now, the, the reason why this is even more relevant to my immediate audience is that Lawrence Tribe was actually a consultant, as he is for a lot of nations. He was a consultant in the construction of the South African Constitution. Uh, which he's done for a number of nations around the world. He and I'm sure a, a, a number of other uh, experts on constitutional issues and, and how it's done. So an interesting observation by John Baker says, the anxious questions asked by the senators about natural law and the nominees disavowal that natural law could have any role in his decision uh, of actual cases and of natural law. Now, let me deflect what I think is one common objection that I get from evangelicals uh, or that evangelicals raise against natural law, because it sounds Catholic. Uh, there's a reason for that. In fact, even the, the, the John Baker noticed the credentials that he has. Distinguished scholar in residence, Catholic university uh, law school. Uh, well, is it Catholic? It's not Catholic. Uh, the reason it seems like it's Catholic will become more and more evident, but the reason pi primarily has to do the philosophical grounding of natural law. That philosophical grounding began to erode in Protestant Christianity several centuries after the Reformation. So that today, the only place you really see this, whatever that philosophical grounding is, is in Catholic Christianity. You don't see it in Protestantism, but it has nothing to do with what the Protestant Reformation was all about. Some people try to make it sound like that's what it was about. And they sort of retroactively try to indict natural law as being Roman somehow. It's not necessarily. A number of resources I would recommend. Daryl Charles's book, uh, Retrieving the Natural Law. And you can get some of the citations here. Stephen Grable's book, uh, Rediscovering the Natural Law in Reformed Theological uh, Ethics. Um, a book that's relevant maybe in terms of the specifics to American law, but natural law and evangelical political thought. But I do think some of the principles would still apply in, in other areas. Now, another objection that might come up as we get close to really saying, okay, give me the, let's get under the hood for a few minutes, is why do we need natural law since, since we have the Bible? And to me, the short answer that, to that is this. If you think of the difference between biblical morality and morality, Think of things that the Bible mandates for us as believers. For example, the observance of the Lord's Supper. But we would never, as Christians, does, at least I don't think we would and hope we would never, require of lost people that they observe the Lord's Supper. In fact, we would forbid them from that. But we would warn them about that, that it wouldn't be in their interest to do so because of the sacredness of the, of the, of, uh, of the Lord's Supper. So there are things then that the Bible commands, but it only commands it to us as believers. But contrast that with, say, prohibitions against murder. Uh, well, when the Bible says you shall not murder, it's not just telling his children. God's not telling just us not to murder. No human should murder. And in a way in which we don't do with, with the uh, Lord's Supper, we do do with 
the prohibition against murder, we seek to enforce that on all humans, not just all believers. So natural law is addressing this second there of moral obligation that accrue to us as human beings, not as saved human beings. Now, let's unpack here uh, a little bit of what natural law is all about. Uh, it arises primarily out of the thinking of Plato and Aristotle, which we'll see here in due course some specifics. But you not only have uh, Plato and Aristotle, but you have Christian uh, sort of sanctified instantiations of their philosophy. For Plato, Platonic philosophy was more or less Christianized and baptized and sanctified by Augustine, and Aristotle was the same thing by Thomas Aquinas. So these four uh, thinkers uh, uh, really serve as the contours of a lot of Western civilization. All right, so uh, let me then begin to get some specifics about the, the theory itself. First of all, we just wanna define what we mean by law. Uh, here's how Aquinas defines law. From the four preceding articles, the definition of law may be gathered. It is nothing else than, and look at these four things, an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community and promulgated. An ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community, whether that's the president, the mayor, the governor, the king, or God, and promulgated. There are various kinds of law. And, and rather than going into detail, I'm just going to list them, and then you can get the, the citations from sources about what they mean. But I want you to see these four levels of law so we can focus on the natural law for the balance of our talk. There is eternal law. That's God's providential working of the universe, the plan by which God governs his creation, his eternal plan for why he created the universe. The natural law, then, is how we as human beings, rational creatures, participate in God's plan for the universe. Some things participate in God's plan because they don't really have any choice. The, the physical world, the fact that trees grow out of certain seeds and, and animals grow from certain embryos are just the way God created. They don't choose to do that or not. But humans are unique in that God has a plan for us as humans that's unique among his creatures on earth. And we have this capacity in some meaningful sense to participate or not, to be on God's side or not. And by the way, the, the details of that are indifferent to the Calvinist Arminian debate. So when I throw in a phrase like free will or whatever, it's not free will in that theological sense that might divide uh, Calvinists and Arminians. Not to say that it might not be relevant to that debate, but I don't want, if you're a reformed thinker, I don't want you to immediately react that somehow this is Arminian because it, it, it smacks of things like uh, human deliberation and free will. Uh, and as an appeal to authority, John Calvin uh, talks about the natural law. In fact, as a lawyer, um, uh, he was steeped in natural law training as, as in his training. Nothing indeed is more common than for man to be sufficiently instructed in a right course of action by natural law, of which the apostle here speaks in Romans 2.14. In 15. He goes on to mention the contributions of the philosophers in that regard. And I think people would be surprised, at least some evangelicals, the number of, uh, of evangelicals uh, from back from, from the Reformation onward who, who were very much steeped in natural law theory. So then just to get the other two out for the sake of completion, then human law would just be a particular application of the natural law to local communities. So in your country, you have laws prohibiting murder, let's say. That's a human way. And how that is enforced, what do you do with people that do murder, are the things that sort of may differ from country to country and from municipality to municipality. But by and large, it's the installing the, the, uh, this moral law in, uh, to local communities. And then the last one there is divine law, which is basically like the Lord's Supper or baptism. They are, and other things that we can discover, that are... God's revelation of his will for us as his, as his children. And they obviously overlap, uh, but there are things that accrue to us that don't apply to, uh, to the non-Christian. All right, so those are the four. We've really kind of answered this question. What's natural about natural law? It's the fact that uh, we have a nature. 
that's how philosophers use the term. It's like an essence. It's what the theologians would call a soul. Basically, the theological word is soul. But it's that in virtue of which we are the kind of thing that we are. Anything's nature is that about a thing that makes it the kind of thing uh, that it is. That's what a nature is. So we want to uh, be careful that we don't confuse a nature, or sometimes you might hear the word substance to mean the same thing in a, in a different context, with an accident, namely a property. This is, I think, part of the problem with the current racial unrest that we're having in the U.S. People are picking on, and, and this can go either way, uh, people are picking out an accidental quality of a human, like race in skin color, and then making that, let's say, well, a white supremacist would pick that and make that the supreme thing that's important, rather than the essence or human, essence or nature of human as being, well, no, that's what's really important, is the fact that they're a human. The fact that they're a, a white human or a black human is relatively trivial. That doesn't really have, that's just a property. You can be a human uh, that's bald or got a full head of hair. Those are sort of accidents or properties. So we want to be careful about that. Now, I, I just have to take a minute, though, to lobby as to why this matters before we wind up what is then the theory look like in detail. Why does it matter to insist that there is something real about us called a nature? I'm emphasizing it because there are so many philosophers today who eschew that concept philosophically. And, I, and the example I use and I got from a, a philosopher, Katursky, uh, from the great book series, the DVD series on, uh, it's basically a university curriculum on DVD, uh, of, from the Nuremberg trials. So we're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Nazis who were put on trial after the Second World War. What's interesting about the Nuremberg trials for our purposes is that the justices of the uh, trial were from the Soviet Union, France, the UK, and the United States. But they couldn't try the Nazis on the basis of the laws of those nations because they weren't citizens of those nations. But they also couldn't try the Nazis on the basis of German law, which they were citizens of, because they didn't do anything illegal by German law. Hitler had already re retooled the German constitution and the law for the final solution to the Jewish question. So German law level, they didn't, they didn't break any laws. So how did they try the defendants? They used a phrase, it wasn't the first time the phrase was used, but I think it was what brought the phrase on a lot of people's radar screen. They indicted the Nazis as having committed crimes against humanity. Now ask yourself, well, what is a humanity? What is a humanity? Is it real in some sense, in any sense of the term, or not? If it's not real in any sense of the term, then how could you commit a crime against it? If it's not even real, if it's just a concept, a placeholder, a trope, or, or you know, concrete particular, or whatever. If you say, well, there has to be some modicum of reality to it then I submit to you for your consideration without argument tonight, but I submit to you that if you start reflecting on what is the nature of this humanity, this sort of what philosophers call a universal, you're probably more likely going to be some version of the thinking of Plato or some version of the thinking of Aristotle. Now, there are other voices out there, but I'm saying predominantly in Western uh, intellectual history, the Platonic and Aristotelian models of the reality of these universals like human or justice. What is justice? Well, we know individual acts to be just, but what is justice? What is it that makes all just acts just? What is it that makes all individual humans humans? That's the question that natural law uh, is playing off of. Now, let's then begin to give it a little bit of content. We mentioned teleology before. By virtue of a thing's nature, it will uh, grow. It will use living things as an example. Uh, if unimpeded, towards its proper end or goal. So this is an acorn. I don't know if you have acorns and oak trees. I know South Africa doesn't have its share of trees uh, down there. Um, but uh, a, 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 it's just a seed of this huge tree that grows uh, in places in the world. So when the acorn grows, 
it 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 becomes a uh, hang on let me let me do something here it becomes i'm going to get to the picture um this huge oak tree right now it doesn't sometimes become a whale and sometimes become something else it never fails to become a full grown tree as long as it's not impeded so that means that as the acorn it has this goal or destiny something is aiming it towards that that's its nature it's determined by the nature it's determined by the kind of thing that it is that's what makes it grow but what we're going to see is more than just physical it's more than just physical even though it is certainly that that humans have some goal towards which we aim but more than just merely growing from a zygote to a full-grown adult there's something uh, moral about us that can only come about by deliberate choices. That's what we're going to see here as we wind, wind this up. That is to say, I don't choose to become a, an adult when I was a zygote. That's just part of this, if you will, almost deterministic kind of machine. I don't like that imagery, but, but at any rate, it works for right now. It's just churning on towards my being an adult. But whether I'm a virtuous adult or not, it's not going to happen automatically. It's only going to happen by a careful attention to how I behave. This is what Proverbs uh, means, I think, when it says, the ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. So you don't just, you don't just automatically become wise. You only become wise by paying close attention to the uh, setbacks that sometimes life delivers to us as individual human beings. We brought the word up good. Notice how we use this word in different ways that on the surface may not even seem like they have anything in common. We talk about, you know, hey, that was really good pizza we had. Uh, that's a good knife you've got. Boy, that's a great car. And, and, and she was such a good person. And, and we use some form of the word good in all of these things. I think there's something that we're getting at when we use these words. Let me pick the knife example. You see a knife like this and you say, well, if somebody said, hey, I got, I got this knife for you for a present, and you look at it and it's all scarred up and the blade is all pitted. And you said, uh, well, that's not a very good knife. What do you mean? Well, this is a good knife. Well, what sense would it make for somebody to go, well, who are you to say what a good knife is? Wouldn't it rather be be the be so that what a good knife is is being everything and having all the attributes that it ought to have by virtue of being a knife? So by virtue of being a knife, it needs to have a certain kind of handle that fits the hand comfortably and a blade that's sharp and strong. That's what it is to be a knife. So a bad knife is bad to the extent that it deviates from what knife is, if you will, using this as an illustration. A good knife is being all it can be and being everything that it, quote, ought to be by virtue of having the characteristics of a knife or by virtue of being a knife. Um, Herbert McCabe, uh, a philosopher, says a perfect X is an X that has all its properties. An imperfect X lacks one or more of its properties. You have to worry about this and be careful about this word properties because today properties are just whatever is true about something. Richard has a property of being bald. Richard has a property of being white. Richard has a property of being a human. Richard probably has a property of being a male. Richard has a property of sitting down. Richard has a property. Of, and, and too many philosophers today treat properties as if they're all in the same plane. But notice that uh, uh, when McCabe is talking, the properties that we have, if we lack those properties, are properties that we ought to have by virtue of the kind of thing that we are, right? That's what we, that's what we mean. So the question then becomes, well, what properties ought a human have? Well, you can think of physical examples. The, the fact that I'm bald or, and, and, and then Karnu is full head of hair is, it would be, is a trivial distinction in contrast to suppose uh, I, I met someone who was missing some fingers off of his hand, say birth, birth defect or a war injury, and they only had three fingers. Well, missing two fingers as a human is not the same as missing hair on top of the head as a human. Why? Because my nature as a human doesn't necessitate not being bald. 
but my nature as a human brings up the ought of having five fingers. And when I'm missing two of them, something is wrong with that physically. The question then becomes, well, what does that have to do with morality? Uh, well, when, when, uh, when you think about there's some aspect of our, of our lives, I'm going to skip that section for the sake of time. Um, there's some aspect of our lives that, that comes about by virtue of our choice and free will. Aristotle says every art and every inquiry and similarly every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has been rightfully declared to be that at which things, all things aim. Now, already, understandably, people go, well, wait a minute. I know people that their actions aim at evil. They don't aim at good. But what Aristotle means here is this. There's a parallel between good with respect to the will and then true with respect to the intellect. You only, one only believes what they, what they take to be true. But it's possible that people can believe things that aren't actually really true. By parallel, people aim at what they desire. But it may not be something that is actually a good. It may be something like the fulfillment of a lust or self-aggrandizement or anger and revenge. But they're still goods in the sense that that's what the person is desiring. So that's what he means and the uh, uh, philosophers mean when they talk about things aiming towards a good. So uh, as the intellect aims towards that which is considered true, the will aims towards that which is considered uh, good. As something may be considered true, this is just what I just got through saying. Um, as something may be considered true that is not really true, something may be considered good that is not really good. Well, how do we discover what is good? What is natural law theory trying to tell us uh, about about that. Let's see if we can then begin to put uh, s some uh, some details in it. And by the way, just to just to prove to you that people do things that they think are good that aren't good. We see this explicit in the Bible. The woman saw that the tree was good. Well, it, it wasn't really good for her to eat of the tree because it was forbidden. Good for food that it was pleasant. That's a version of desirable. To the, uh, to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Notice all that. And you just find tons of these kind of references. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The point being, and there's quote after quote that you can get from the slide deck, the point being, the will is always aiming as what it rightly or wrongly perceives to be the good. All right? So that's what it just means to aim uh, the will. So what about a human being then, more directly? A human being, now watch how much is nested in this that ought to prompt some questions and are things uh, that we can't go into detail. But I do this on purpose, just to stir the waters, to go, well, wait a minute. It looks like you've just imported a whole lot. A human being is a good human being when he acts well. I've kind of already said it has to do with that aspect of us that's unique to us, our reason and deliberative uh, free will that makes us distinct from animals. That's part of our being in the image of God, I would argue. So maybe we kind of already dealt with that. But a human is a good human when he acts well, since it is a perfection of a human to have a virtuous character in accordance with the kind of thing he is by virtue of his human nature or essence. Now, obviously, the questions and objections can be raised. There's a lot of disagreement as to what might be considered acting well and virtuous character, whatever. Uh, let me just, before I forget, try to deflect that objection because I think the objection doesn't have as much force as it appears. Uh, it's actually less true than a lot of people realize that morality is that diverse throughout the world. In fact, there is such a unanimity to basic moral principles in most of the world's philosophies with which I'm familiar and world religions with them, with them with which I'm familiar, that it becomes very conspicuous by the, by the unanimity among that, from Confucius to Aristotle to, to, uh, to the uh, scriptures uh, to uh, Hinduism. I mean, in other presentations, I go into some specifics, and I'll recommend the resources we get to the end that can give you some specifics. One that comes to mind is uh, 
C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man. Uh, in, in the appendix there, uh, he has a just a litany of moral principles from all over the world. What is that pointing to? That that this morality that arises out of human nature isn't absolutely eradicated by the fall. It's still, by God's grace, has a way of rising to the top and be identifiable. And we can justify that philosophically on the basis, I think, of natural law theory. Now, let me quickly contrast evil with good. Uh, and I've already done this. The uh, uh, Contemporary philosophers talk about evil like they talk about natural evil, which would be things like, you know, tsunamis and earthquakes and uh, hurricanes, <clears throat> you know, or, uh, fires, devastating fires, and things that just cause unnecessary, unwarranted pain and suffering. Then we talk about moral evil. And so we mentioned people like Hitler or, or, or Stalin or Mao or Jeffrey Dahmer, who was a notorious serial, serial killer and cannibal in, in the United States as a sort of moral evil. Uh, but traditionally, Christianity said there's, there's a little bit more to evil than just something that just causes pain. Uh, Augustine said it this way, evil is a privation. You already know this because we've already said it here tonight. But I want to say it in a different way quickly to see how it fits into Augustine's notion. Augustine would say, look, there's a difference between being nothing, just totally unreal, and then not a thing. Being nothing and not being a thing. Augustine argued that evil is real, but it's not a thing. This, this deflects the, uh, how, if, God, if evil is real, then God must have created it since he created all things. No. It's a privation or a lack in things. We've already seen that with the fingers uh, illustration, hopefully. Evil is the privation of a good. So evil is when something is missing, just like blindness. You know, blindness is a privation in a human. It's not a privation in a rock, right? We don't call a rock blind. Why? Because it's not of the nature of a rock to be able to see. So when a rock doesn't see, it's not missing anything. It is of the nature of a human to see. So when a human doesn't see, something is wrong. Something has gone wrong. That is an evil uh, uh, there. All right. But now, though, it isn't clear, I don't think yet, then what's the difference between this idea of good? I can, I can relate to the fact that blindness is an evil in, in some sense, but it's not a moral evil, is it? We don't. A person who goes blind hasn't committed a sin, have they? A person who lost his a, a limb in defending his country is not a sinner, surely. And I say, absolutely. That's because we have to carefully distinguish good and moral good. Moral good is a subset of good. Well, what's the, what's the connection here between good and moral good? As I said already, and I, I can't defend all of these without just taking an entire semester. And even still, it might not be compelling to some people. But this is at least what the theory says. Human beings are unique among God's creatures on earth inasmuch as we have rationality and free will. So that's what enables us uh, uh, to choose not merely among particular goods, but enables us to choose the good itself, the good as good, not just it's good to eat, so I'm going to do that. But I do something for the sake of it being a good. But here's the kicker, and this is where it, the, 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 uh, the key point comes in. But it also allows us to choose against our natures uh, and against our proper end or good. All right, so a lion can never fail to behave like a lion. It, it never will identify as a hyena. OK, they don't have those problems in the animal kingdom. Its instinct will always make it act the same way. It's tell us is inevitable unless it itself is eaten by a pack of hyenas, let's say. But humans are unique because while there are things about our physical bodies that are the same as the lion in the sense that we're both animals, there's something about what Paul calls our inner man that isn't automatic. It's something that only comes about by my exercising my free will and my rationality to aim towards actualizing 
my good as a human being. And again, if you say, well, what's a, what is the good in that sense for the human being? It's what people, since humans have been talking about this stuff, is something that almost all human civilizations have recognized and identified, uh, the virtues. Now, uh, again, the C.S. Lewis uh, point I brought to deflect that, there really isn't different moralities. And people say, well, but wait a minute. There are some cultures where it's perfectly acceptable for women to be bare-breasted in public, whereas in a lot of Western uh, cultures, that's considered indecent. So right there, you've got different moralities, the objection goes. But, but Lewis would say, no, those aren't different moralities uh, because they both have the same morality, namely, you ought to be decent in public. What constitutes decency may change from culture to culture. Uh, it's changed even within cultures over time. But the principle of decency is you see all over. Thou shalt not kill. That didn't necessarily mean that a tribe might not kill another tribe, let's say in some Central American country uh, as they war. South American, uh, my wife grew up in South America, uh, and they, there are tribes that live out in the uh, Brazilian jungle, and, and some of them will war against each other. So you go, well, see, they, they just threw the concept of murder out the window. No, they didn't. They had the same sort of vestigial uh, concept because they would never murder somebody from their own tribe. That was verboten, if you will. The problem was they were losing the facts that these people in the other tribe were just as human as they are. Or we may do that with over race. And some, some humans may enslave other humans on the basis of their race and forgetting the fact that they are humans. And that's what, what where they, but they never, uh, some cultures would have never enslaved their own, at least in the in, in slavery in the United States, you pretty much wouldn't find uh, white people enslaving other white people like you find white people enslaving uh, blacks, for example, uh, there. So the, the principles are still there. So um, now, so the good then is, is that towards which we aim by virtue of our nature. Now, what does this have to do uh, with God? How does, how does he get in uh, to the mix? L let me just give you a short argument here, but all of the premises need to be unpacked and defended, but we won't take the time to do that because I want to try to finish here in about five minutes uh, and, and, uh, and just go to some, uh, maybe if there's some questions out there that we can, we can deal uh, with. Uh, here's the first premise. Good is identified with desirable. That was the Aristotelian quote, or sometimes you'll see the word appetible, meaning appealing to the appetite. It's not necessarily physical appetite like eating, but it could be immaterial appetite like a desire for love. You love someone and you're, you desire them, for example, as you fall in love uh, for somebody you, you marry, whatever. Now, desirable is identified with perfect. Why is that? Because the reason a person desires a thing is that they rightly or wrongly see that thing as something completing them. Either it satiates a hunger that I have physically, it satisfies me sexually, physically, or it satisfies me in terms of deep emotions and deep, profound issues of love or, or, or friendship or whatever, any, any kind of thing. That it, it is something thought to uh, be desired because it it just fulfills one. That's what you mean by this being a goal or an end or a purpose. It's something that you aim towards. And for these, I have citations from, from different philosophers or whatever. Um, uh, but Aquinas says it this way, everything is perfect insofar as it is actual. So think about it this way. The will aims for some kind of object out there that it desires. Let's say I want to be uh, more wise, and I'm desiring that. Well, the perfection in me is when that thing desired becomes real. It becomes existent. It is made to be. It, it, it is actualized in me. That's, that's what does it. Uh, what's very interesting, I, I have to do this quote because I like Uncle Joe. Now, it, uh, I discovered it, my first trip to South Africa in 2008, I discovered, and a lot of cultures do this, that children will address male adults that they're not related to as uncle. <laughs> so the first family I stayed with, their kids were calling me Uncle Richard. I was like, yeah, it's pretty special, you know, until I found out afterwards that no, they, 
children call every adult male that they're having social uh, interaction with uncle if they don't already know some other way to call them or whatever. So I thought, oh, clear. we don't do that in the United States. Nobody's your uncle except your actual physical uncle. But as a gesture of affection, I call Joseph Owens Uncle Joe to my, in my, to my colleagues at the seminary because I like him. But there's a word there that Aristotle uses in the Greek. I just have to tell you this to impress you with my knowledge of Greek. Okay, now I was being sarcastic. Uh, an alternative word for actuality in this respect is perfection. It's the Greek word intelikia. You may have heard the word intelliki. It was used by Aristotle along with actuality to designate the formal elements in things, the, 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 the elements that comprise the essence of things. Now watch where this goes. This word perfection in our actuality, intelikia, look where it comes from in terms of its roots in Greek. It comes from the combination of three words, in, which is in, which means in, <laughs> telos, which is end, or goal, which you've, we've already seen, and then the infinitive, ekain, which means to have. Isn't that interesting that the word perfection in Greek literally means, or etymologically means, to have the end or the goal in? To reach one's end or goal is to reach someone's perfection. It is to make that perfection real. Real meaning being or existence. So actuality is identified with being. All right? Just watch where this goes. The rest of them cascade pretty quickly. Uh, being is identified. Uh, actuality is, being, uh, is identified with being. God, we argue, is goodness itself inasmuch as he is being itself. And just to throw out a teaser, maybe this could be a future uh, Ratio Christi. In my judgment, what's going on here under, under the bonnet, if you will, um, is, is uh, details that I think really do answer the Euthyphro dilemma in ways in which I think a lot of what I hear in apologetics still doesn't push it across the finish line. When you say, well, good is that which according to God's nature, okay? Well, if, if that's what good is, is good is just a, that which is according to God's nature, then the statement, God is good, just means God is according to God's nature. But everything is according to its nature. Satan is according to Satan's nature. It still doesn't tell you anything about God, I don't think. How do, how do, what pushes the, the solution to the Euthyphro dilemma and in other uh, issues, too, uh, and I think it's going to be the stuff that's going on under the bonnet here that we're not going into the detail uh, of, uh, of the notion of God being, being itself or being goodness itself. So here's an article on my website. Remember I said, if I say there's a paper on my website, here's one you'll do, you can go get. It's titled The Convertibility of Being and Good in St. Thomas Aquinas. So it's a little hard to see. You can get that as a PDF. Now, obviously, there are some beings that are not good. So how could Aquinas say to be and to be good are the same thing? Uh, I commend to your reading uh, Jan Artson's article uh, there, which is a distillation of these two mammoth lifetime achievements in philosophy uh, there. All right. So from there, what we would do is then go on to try to tease out then how moral obligations arise from that, uh, and it gets us back to that initial statement about law. Uh, why are you morally obligated in principle to obey the governmental authorities in your country? Well, in principle, because it's the task of the governmental authorities to seek out the good of the country. They're acting in the interest of the citizen. Now, they don't always do that, literally, in our country or yours either, but I'm saying in principle. So in principle, the oughtness arises in one place, by the fact that I obey the authorities because they have my good at heart. You extend that to God as the creator and superintendent, all-powerful, all-knowing uh, goodness itself, then his will for us is our good. And so you desire your good, and that's what it means to desire is the good. So now it's just a matter of trying to displace where we get off track of thinking, hey, I thought getting drunk and having indiscriminate sex was good, 
and it turns out it isn't good. It's destroying not only my body, but my, my soul. And then, so you can go into that. We, and what I do in the presentation, but won't take the time now, because I want to be sensitive about our time together, uh, is look at the moral obligations with respect to our fellow man, and then with respect to, uh, 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 to God uh, there. And the latter there is probably the most familiar with most audiences who are Christian, because this we get so explicitly from, uh, from the uh, revealed truth. So let me end with this one caveat about natural law. It doesn't tell us everything about morality. Um, it just tells us broad principles uh, that lead to human flourishing, or at least intended to lead to human flourishing, because that's the way God has made us. So here's one contrast. The natural law m m tells us not to murder. But Jesus says, well, you've heard that you shouldn't murder, but I'm telling you, you shouldn't even hate. Well, the natural law doesn't tell you necessarily not to hate. It doesn't really say much about a lot of your internal motivations. The natural law says to be faithful to your spouse or spouses, if that's the case, to not just indiscriminately run around with other uh, men or women, irrespective of, of commitments and, and, and things, right? But Jesus said, uh, you've heard it said of old, because it's from the law of Moses, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, if any man lusts after a woman, he's committed adultery already in his heart. And you're thinking, well, flip. Uh, I thought I was doing pretty good because the natural law tells me not to commit adultery. And I've, I've never really done that. You know, I, I've never committed adultery. I'm, I'm faithful to my wife. Well, no, 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 no. it's more than that. So you see in a lot of instances, what Jesus does in the Beatitudes, which we they sh the Jews should have understood all the way back to Abraham, uh, is that uh, all the law was doing in that instance was just pointing to us how we end up failing to meet its standards. And that's hopefully what God uses to propel us to a plea for his mercy to say, I have fallen short of your glory and I need some compensation, indeed atonement there. All right, so let me just suggest a few resources as we close. Uh, David Haynes, uh, I, I can't take credit for this book, but David Haynes was one of my students at the seminary, actually directed his master's thesis, but he's one of many instances where the, the student has become greater than his master, <laughs> okay? So uh, he and uh, Andrew Fulford have written a great book. Now, I've, I'm taking it on authority that uh, Carnu has uh, read this book and is has touted its, its virtues, both for its, its completeness and, and, com and clarity, but brevity at the same time. You don't get lost in too many details. Uh, so biblical defense. I already mentioned uh, Abolition of Man, uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, a great book that's a summary defense of uh, natural law, a little bit more detailed than uh, David and Andrew's book, Written on the Heart, The Case for Natural Law by J. Budashevsky. Uh, something that's somewhat geared to an American audience, but the principles will apply. It's Frank Turek and Norm Geisler's book, Legislating Morality. And they have an appendix, not unlike the abolition of man, where they give some examples of, of what uh, one of our founding fathers called common morality from all around uh, the world. I already mentioned the natural law and evangelical political thought, D Daryl Charles's book, uh, and also Stephen uh, Grable's book. Uh, a gentleman I know has been to South Africa. Some of you may know this gentleman, David Van Drunen. Uh, he has an article. You can get the PDF and find out which edition this is and then go to your library at the, at the campus and get this article called Medieval Natural Law and the Reformation, a Comparison of Aquinas and Calvin. He's actually written a full-length treatment, Divine Covenants and the Moral Order. When it comes to the, some of the philosophy of Aquinas that undergirds most of this natural law theory, Edward Fazer's book on Aquinas is great. To get much more in, in depth, you'll want to get his uh, scholastic metaphysics. That sounds like something you want to curl up with tonight, doesn't it? Instead of going out with your with your significant other for a nice dinner and a movie, which you can't do that in, in some places yet. Uh, no, man, I want to read scholastic metaphysics, man. You can't put it down. It's a page turn. It actually is a page turn uh, if you're a philosophy geek like most of us are. If you're choking on this idea of essence or nature, uh, because there's so much pushback against this in contemporary analytic philosophy, I, I would highly recommend David Oderberg's book, Real Essentialism. He's at Oxford University. And what he does 
is takes on a defense of the reality of natures metaphysically against modern analytic objections from analytic philosophy. Uh, just a few more, Carnu. Uh, uh, John Nassus's book, Being in Some uh, 20th Century Thomas, has to do with being and good. I mentioned Artson's article, his full length stuff are medieval philosophy and transcendental thought and medieval philosophy and transcendentals. I'm going fast because I want to just get them out. The last one here is a contemporary book, Being and Goodness, the Concept of the Good in Metaphysics and Philosophical Theology. And Scott McDonald is at, at uh, University of Notre Dame, who is also a, uh, what we'd call a philosophical realist. Voila. Now, I skipped a lot, but I just invite you to go get the, uh, the decks uh, to un unpack that. Now, Mr. Uh, Van Hirden, do we have any salient questions? Stump the ball headed guest speaker. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Richard. This this was a really great presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, we have some uh, questions here, but I thought, you know, instead of Q&A, we'll just do Q. So we just yes. throw all the questions. We can get just the questions. Let's in. just get the questions out, say goodnight, and we're all back back home. There we go. Yeah, yeah you know, so just, uh, yeah. No, no, no. Don't worry uh, for our listeners. No, we ought to try just do A. I'll just give a bunch of answers, and then you just pick yep. the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so uh, here we go. Let me just quickly have a look here. Okay, um, I'm going to start off with some questions we uh, from the YouTube live stream. Okay. And some other independent questions that may be coming in. The qu first question we have is, um, what do you think about the version of the moral argument for God's existence used by apologists such as William Lane Craig and others. Would you see, would you use a similar argument based on natural law theory? Uh, the answer is, uh, yeah, I would use, it is similar, but I, I think the argument is uh, missing some premises. Because, and, and, and Bill and I have talked about this. He did a, I did a presentation on natural law, at one of our conferences, and he did a podcast responding to my presentation. And then we talked about it at a, in an evangelical philosophical society meeting just, just a little bit. Um, so I was like, uh, but anyway, but yeah, I think that, that it's not so much the objectivity of morality that I think screams for explanation. Because I would argue that to a, to a large extent, but not ultimately, but to a large extent, the objectivity of morality arises from the reality of human nature. Morality tracks what uh, ain't what uh, uh, picks out human flourishing. What we call, I don't mean flourishing like we got a lot of food and we got a lot of money, flourishing in terms of the inner man, of, the, of what people have identified as the virtues. So, but you need God as an explanation of why there is the human nature. That was actually one of uh, Dr. Craig's criticisms of me. He said, well, Howes makes the moral argument collapse into the cosmological argument. And I go, I, I do. Why? Because being and good ultimately are the same thing. But to show how that is takes a little bit more premises than uh, if God does not exist, objective moral, objective moral uh, truths do not exist. Uh, objective moral truths do exist. Therefore, God exists. The modus tollens form of the argument. I think it's, I think this is why I think it's, we have common ground to a certain extent with uh, atheists who keep crying, I can be moral as an atheist. And I think we can say, yes, to a certain extent, you can be a virtuous human being, just like a Christian can be a scoundrel. Being a Christian doesn't guarantee that we do the right thing, but being an atheist doesn't guarantee they never do the right thing in terms of what God expects of human beings. In fact, I would argue this is the very way that Romans 2 is making a case. This is how we know uh, 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 that there is a God because he's given us this, this manner according to which we conduct ourselves, even apart from God's special revelation. So yeah, I, I take a little bit of exception to the way Bill um, frames the argument because I think it doesn't really complete. It's got some missing premises. But in his defense, he would not agree with the metaphysics that I appeal to to make my case. So he couldn't make the case that I make because he doesn't agree with me about 
natures, for example. So then it just becomes kind of a debate about the metaphysics that underlie the two approaches. And, and we got into that a little bit on a, on a panel debate at, at uh, uh, Evangelical Philosophical Society in the American Academy of Religion. You can go on YouTube and if you type my name and his name, it's a, we had a debate on the doctrine of, of simplicity and we touched on the questions of metaphysics there. But yes. That's another thing if a person has felt trouble falling asleep when they get to my paper there. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next question. This is uh, surrounding the context of uh, when you said that Ro uh, it's a natural law is not a um, Roman Catholic. You, you distinguish it doesn't just belong to Roman Catholicism. Um, yes. So this question is surrounding that context. Isn't natural law part of Thomistic philosophy, though? So. It, 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 uh, it is, yes, especially in the details to the extent that I could get to them tonight, uh, that I had tonight, it's Thomistic, it is definitely Thomistic. And interestingly, Thomistic philosophy endured in Protestant thinking, and I should just say a lot of medieval thinking endured into Protestant thinking well beyond the Protestant Reformation. The reformers, with the exception of Luther specifically, the reformers weren't necessarily repudiating Aquinas necessarily, and that's, or for that matter, even Aristotle. I mean, the, the, the citations that you'll get if you go get the PDF slide deck from Calvin, from the Puritans, John Owen, Francis Turretin, Stephen Charnock, all of these guys were, were robust classical realists in, in a sufficient way that they were very sympathetic. In fact, a book I would recommend, uh, also, I didn't put it in this, but because the question came up, is, uh, is Arvin Voss's book, let me, let me clear my screen so I can see, uh, uh, Aquinas, Calvin, and Contemporary Protestant Thought, a critique of Protestant views on the thought of Thomas Aquinas, okay? So it, it, he just picked several different issues in there. And, and very often his, his uh, point is, they're much more alike than a lot of Aqu uh, Aquinas' critics make it out to be that are contemporary Calvinists. And, it, and it, uh, it doesn't help when, in, in my judgment, a lot of contemporary critics of Aquinas within evangelicalism have seemed to me to be not very conversant in Aquinas's. They haven't read much about Aquinas, especially some of the more important secondary sources. So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding yeah. uh, there. Yeah, and and, and, I, and obviously there's the, theology that Aquinas embraced that I would absolutely reject as a Protestant and an evangelical. But the metaphysics are a different different issue. Yes. Now, thank you, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I think from just if I could say something there as well, if I, I could wish you would please read, uh, on that is um. I'm trying to remember his name. Is it the paper is a bit? Uh, it's not recent. Um, uh, John T. McNeil, uh, Natural Law and the Reformers. So, if mm. you just type that in, I think you'll find it's a really good paper. He analyzes how people like Luther and Calvin and those guys actually uh, referenced uh, and made use of natural law. So yeah. yes. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, in your opinion. Can an atheist be justified in appealing to natural law theory in order to explain objective morality? I think so, yes. Yeah, I think that can be justified. But remember my distinction between proximate and ultimate. Uh, eventually, I think if you, in fact, this is what I think the moral argument for God's existence is explicitly designed to do. And that is, once the atheist has stumbled on some truths about reality, you can take those truths and prove the God of the Bible. That's what classical apologetics is best at. <clears throat> some of those truths are, that we're used to thinking of are truths about the universe, you know, and fine tuning and all the kind of things we're, we're all used to in all these arguments. But some of those truths are moral truths, that they know that, that, that uh, certain things are, are wrong for humans to do. Um, and so you can, you can, I think, argue, well, the only reason that is a moral truth is because there's a such thing as what is good for humans that lead to their flourishing. 
but there can only be a good for humans because they have a teleology. But they only have a teleology because they have a nature. And they only have a nature because there's a nature maker. That's God. You can't, you can't have this nature. This is, this is the, uh, the failing of Aristotle. He pushes it back to the nature, and then he just, he just stops. And, he, if, and if anybody ever, he wouldn't even think about where it came from. He would just, well, it's always been here. The universe is eternal. The Christians come along and go, no, you still haven't explained it fully, or to use my term, ultimately. And the ultimate explanation is going to be Christian theism. Uh, and that's how the argument plays, is taking that truth that that atheist may stumble on. Lots of atheists have written on morality. And you would, I, I dare say most Christians would agree with a lot of the things that they say about uh, fidelity and, and truthfulness and, and humility and, and, and uh, uh, courage and friendship. Because, because we, they can't escape the fact that they're humans created in the image of God. The fall did not eradicate the, uh, our being in the image of God. And, and the most ardent Calvinists will tell you that. The, the, most, the, most, the most enthusiastic Calvinists and their commitment to total depravity will be quick to tell you total depravity doesn't mean they're as evil as they could possibly be. Yeah. And Peter okay. talks about the, the sinners being still in the image of God. Hmm. Okay, awesome. Uh, next question. Uh, is this is surrounding when you uh, spoke about evil as a privation or a lack of something that should be there? Um, the question is, is that uh, li uh, like black is the lack of reflected light as opposed to white is the reflection of all wavelengths? Not quite. The difference is this. Uh, Black as, a, as an absence of light isn't necessarily the absence of something that ought to be there. That is to say, there may be some instances where the light ought not be there. Like, say, if you're uh, doing some type of chemical um, uh, uh, development of film, then the light ought not be there. So the light would be evil if somebody opened the door in your, in your processing room. right. So the key is not just absence. It's the absence of something that ought to be there by virtue of the kind of thing that it is. So the fact that I don't have wings is not a privation as a human, because as a human, I'm not, I, I ought not have wings. But, but the fact that I might be missing fingers on my hand is an absence, or I might be blind is an absence, right? So that's, that's the difference. So that is a very good question. I'm glad it was asked, because I think it's it's easy, especially when we go through it as quickly as we did, it's easy to, to miss that it's not just merely absence or privation, but the absence or privation of something that ought to be there by virtue of the kind of thing uh, a thing is by virtue of its nature. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what would you say is the biggest philosophical and theological influence which caused natural law to disappear in Protestant circles the last couple of centuries? Um, without doing a lot of research on this, but just what I've picked up over the years from others who have done in this, I would say one of the first things that comes to my mind is nominalism. So nominalism is the denial that there are metaphysical aspects two things that that i as a physical human being have something metaphysically some metaphysical aspect to me like my human nature what what my form or my substance or whatever nominalists deny that and and i don't want to be unfair to bill craig but i think it's to some extent his view is a nominalism now his view hasn't led him because what he's been able to do since he's a christian is that he's been able to, or he's trying to uh, uh, bolster a, a justification of the same morality that the, his fellow Christians have with a different philosophical foundation. I, I don't think it works personally, but, but that's just part of the debate that philosophers have. So nominalism is, is uh, probably one of the, the worst things. And that came on um, after, uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages with people like Occam. And you see it again in even more extreme form in somebody like Hume. Uh, so it, it is plagued, there are other things too, but it has plagued Western thought 
Um, and it plagues even Catholic thought. It's just that at least with Catholicism, they have the ability to appeal to Aquinas because he's been decreed by papal decree to uh, everything has to line up with Aquinas. The problem is that's like saying everything has to line up with the Bible. And then you get the Armenians and the Calvinists and the Molas and everybody's biblical. Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, our, we're biblical. It doesn't really, the people have different, they do the same thing with Aquinas. They go, oh, yeah, I'm Thomistic, but I don't think, I don't go on. It doesn't sound Thomistic to me, but that's a different debate. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I think we'll take these last uh, two questions. Uh, next question. Are the canons of Dort referring to natural law theory? And this is a quotation <clears throat> from chapter three, uh, articles four to six. Um, and this is where it speaks of natural law. A certain light of nature remaining in all people after the fall. Would you say that quotation from the canons of Dort referred to natural law? Uh, my initial reaction is to say, no, I don't think so. Um, but I'd, I'd probably have to read a little bit more of the context and the background to know. I'm not, I'm not, a, not a scholar in Dortian uh, history. Uh, but the reason I say I don't necessarily think so is because very often this kind of language is also talked about uh, where it's referring to the sensus divinitatis, the, 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 the internal sense that there is God, that God is out there, that we attribute, some people would attribute to a, a work of the Holy Spirit. So that, and so that's what they take this Romans 2.14, that the works of the law are written on the heart. They may do that. So I don't know whether they do, but but they may. So uh, I don't think it is that. My initial response is I think it's probably more reference to the census uh, divinitatis rather than what the natural law is. And notice that the Romans 2, 14 and 15 verse does not say that the law is written on the heart. And almost every time I hear somebody quote that verse, they misquote the verse. It doesn't say the law of God is written on the heart. It says the work of the law is written on the heart which I take that to mean the very thing that we're talking about philosophically of that teleology that we've all talked about and, and they can get into more detail, that that towards which the law is aiming you is your good. That, and that's, that is, is in your heart because you are longing for your good, except with the fall now, which is another thing Aristotle didn't understand, obviously. The fall has really complicated the equation, hasn't it? Because the fall has perverted our ability to think in terms of proper, think properly in terms of our good very often. We, we do desire fulfillment of lust. You know, we do desire things that, that kill us physically, drug abuse. We do actually do these things. And it's interesting in the Nicomachean Ethics, when Aristotle is examining human morality, when he gets to the actual example of people that why do they do things that they've got to know that's not good for them? And I've been saying you only do it, you know, you're always aiming at the good. That's what's desirable. And these people are obviously not doing what looks, and he's going, how does this happen? It's very conspicuous to me as a Christian, his inability to account for it. It sounds like Romans chapter seven, when you read it in Aristotle. And the best he comes up with is, this, well, you know, sort of like being drunk. A drunk man, sometimes he just kind of acts differently than he otherwise would act if he wasn't drunk and you're like okay I, I get the i get the illustration but i'm not sure what it's illustrating mm -hmm. exactly but we as christians i would rec would immediately recognize that as romans chapter 7 as as this sin the law of sin in me this keeps plaguing my ability to be the virtuous human that i part of me wants to do that i you know i would do i do not but that that i do don't want to do i do who's going to deliver me from the body of this death and then chapter eight gives us the spirit and it's the indwelling in the spirit that, you know, and we know this as Christians, Aristotle didn't know this. Aquinas knew this. So in Aquinas, it gets more, the, the theory gets more uh, sculpted in, a, in, in line with his Christian commitments, but Aristotle laying the sort of metaphysical foundations, he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't have the whole truth. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And I think our next question actually segues a bit into what you just depicted there, but um, the specific question is, does Romans chapter 8 verse 7 say anything about the atheist's ability to obey the natural law? Now, I saw the question pop up. I've got my, my sword over here. Uh, <laughs> I didn't uh, have Romans uh, memorized yet. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 7. And I'll just quickly read the verse. Um, I'll just read it in context from verse 6 until uh, yeah, verse 8. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, uh, this is a very important point in chapter. And uh, it, it's not something that, that uh, we have the liberty of getting into. But I'll just uh, throw a grenade right in the middle of the conversation. I think, by and large, the, the distinctions that are being drawn in Romans 8 is not a distinction necessarily between the lost and the saved. He's already, Paul's argument in Romans is way beyond justification. Romans 6, shall we sin that grace may abound? He's talking about sanctification, the, the, the life, uh, Romans 7, to tee up the answer to Romans 7 for the Christian. And I take the, the, the chapter to be a chapter juxtaposing two different ways that, that, a, that two different ways of life that can plague or liberate the person who's already saved. Now, that is uh, a startling point of view, I think, in most people's hearing to say, how? That just sounds crazy. Because everybody, I, I, or I shouldn't say everybody, but so many people I know will take Romans 8 as if it's juxtaposing uh, the lost and the saved. It's juxtaposing the way of life and the way of death. And that way of life and way of death uh, still may or may not happen for the Christian. There's a way of death for the Christian, not eternal death, because that's irrevocable. Because once the righteousness of God is imputed to us, our eternal destiny is irrevocable. You can't lose your eternal life. But you can lose life, physical life, and flourishing by following the, the, the sin. So it's, I take Romans 8 to be sort of like the uh, Galatians uh, struggle of the flesh and the spirit. Those flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that we do the things that we don't want. That That's just sort of the the, the life uh, of the of the uh, can be the life of the Christian. Now, what does that say about the lost? Uh, I don't think it's a counterexample to the point that a an atheist can tell the truth as opposed to lie. Whatever we want to go on to say theologically, yeah, but even in telling the truth, he's not ultimately doing it for the glory of God. I think that's completely legitimate. That's fine. But that's that's more of a theological extrapolation from it. The simple point was an atheist can know the difference between telling the truth and telling a lie and be motivated to be a truth teller and not a liar. Atheists can be that way. Of course, they can be that way. And even though they might not ultimately do it for the right reasons, and so it doesn't merit anything, that's fine. That's, I think, important theology. I'm dealing with a very minimal initial stage of the, of the metaphysics that underlie the, the, the morality itself at a proximate kind of level. But these kind of questions have to come up to drag us beyond what I'm doing. Okay, how we need to get now and flesh out the theology. And I go, amen, we need to do that. And that's why we have the theologians among us who, who help us with that. Otherwise, we get stalled back and don't get the rest of the story like we're supposed to especially given the fact that the appeal is to revealed truth, which augments whatever I could have said in no matter how many hours of lecture, the revealed truth is going to augment anything I could have possibly come up with based on uh, the metaphysics. Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we, we're going to end off now with Q and a, but the thing is, yeah, this, so, oh, yeah, product placement. Yes, of course. No, so. We'll probably get flagged on YouTube for product placement there. But we yeah. don't get any money from Dasani, which is Coca-Cola. They're not sponsoring this, so I don't want to in implicate them. All yeah. the ideas and opinions are just my own. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but, yeah, thank you again. And like I say, this for, for this topic, man, there are so many questions and so many avenues of approach and so many things we can discuss because natural law theory – in itself uh, has a lot of explanatory power. And in, I've seen through some of my own reading, it applies to a lot of things from politics to mm -hmm. ethics to uh, business to, I don't know, it just, it's really 
you know, really absolutely. Practical. So we can talk about it all the way, uh, you know, for days on end. But but thank you again for taking this uh, topic and condensing it for us and presenting it to us and taking your time to share with us your knowledge. And we really appreciate it. Yes. Well, you, you are more than welcome. It's an honor for me to be here. And all of you who who came light to the live stream, thank you for your 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 attention. And I look forward to another uh, another time together. Yes. And I also just want to give a special thanks and shout out to our, our technology brothers that work the technology. You have really helped us tonight um, with our technical difficulties and the way you just jump on it. And, you know, it's it's amazing. Thank you, guys. You guys are, are really amazing. We, uh, and yeah, thank you so much, um, Andre and Gior. Um, and so, so yeah, um, I think then we will end off for tonight. But before I do that, I have some announcements for uh, concerning next week. And next week, we are going to have a it's sort of a special week because we're going to have two live streams next week. Um, firstly, on the Monday, we will have a live stream with Dr. Michael Kruger concerning mm. the formation of the New Testament canon. Um, it will also take place at 8 o'clock, like all of our live streams. Um, so that's Monday, 8 o'clock. Um, and so, and on the Thursday um, next week, we will also at uh, eight o'clock, uh, we will have Dima Rosette, uh, if, I, if I pronounce his name correctly, will be speaking to us about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Mm. So really two exciting talks. I think we're all looking forward to. Um, and yeah, so I think that is all from my side. Um, yes, thank you again, Richard. And for all you out there watching the live streaming uh, stuff, thank you for coming. Thank you for your patience for our stuff tonight. And um, yeah, may the Lord bless you. Uh, keep safe. And uh, yes, God be with you all. Amen.